Well, good morning. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee. We Thy love and grace proclaim. Let's stand together as we sing. Glorious is Thy name. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee. We Thy love and grace proclaim. Thou art mighty, Thou art holy. Glorious is Thy matchless name. Glorious, glorious, glorious is Thy name. Father God, we are grateful to be in this place, and we acknowledge your power and your might this morning. God, we are grateful to 
uh, serve a, a God who is all-powerful. And uh, God, as we acknowledge often that, that there is no equal, uh, your, your strength and your might stands alone, and, and we are grateful uh, to serve you uh, this morning. And so, God, as we gather together, uh, may we lift our voices in worship and celebration. Uh, God, may we uh, just rejoice in, in your goodness as we enjoy our time together this morning um, and our, the unity that we share together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. If you're here for the first time, we say welcome. We would love for you to, to grab one of the connection cards out of the pew in front of you and to fill that out and drop that in one of the offering baskets as you dismiss this morning. Um, also, uh, if you're watching online, we say welcome. We um, are glad that we have the capability to do this and uh, to maximize our uh, our outreach. And so uh, we'd love for you to share this on your timeline if you're watching on, on Facebook right now. I uh, want to encourage you, mentioned this last week, and just want to kind of continue this theme, um, just to continue to pray for families in our church. There, there is a lot going on. There is a lot going on. Um, and, and so just be praying for families. I, I, I said this in one of the early services earlier. Uh, the best way to do this is to just log on to uh, the church directory and just start praying for people as you as you see their 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 name or their picture. Um, that there is there is a just a tremendous amount of, of things that that need to be lifted up and uh, so use the resources that we have that we make available to you to continue to do that. Um, but we we've got several families who are in need of prayer right now. I um, also just want to, again, thank God's Helping Hands for the, the work that they're doing. Uh, they had another project yesterday. Uh, we'll be sharing those pictures um, on uh, social media this week, and I hope to have a picture of that also for you here um, in, in the service next week as well. Um, and talking with Doug again this week, one of the things that, that he um, has uh, continued to, to just ask for that I want to make known to you is um, – the, the work that they're doing is, is good and is important. It's very helpful to the families. But, but what he longs for is to go beyond just the physical labor um, and to have people who are available to actually get to know the homeowner and, and to build a relationship and to use that as a platform to share the gospel. Uh, they're doing really good work, but he, he wants to see that go beyond just the work that they're doing and meeting physical needs to meeting spiritual needs. And so uh, they, they do these projects uh, typically the second Saturday of every month. And if you are ever free and, and want to just go and visit with a homeowner, that, that is what he has desired from the beginning. And so um, he wants to have that relationship and impact with the, the homeowner. So um, continue to, to consider that, please, and, and be involved in that. Uh, one, one quick announcement for student ministry. Uh, we are, at, at the moment, planning uh, to, to do our winter retreat as normal, which is going to be December the 28th through the 30th. Uh, information in the packet will be posted on the website this afternoon, um, the 28th through the 30th. Uh, there is a hard cap on spaces just because of the restrictions that exist in the state of North Carolina. And so um, if you have students who are interested in being a part of that, um, you need to, uh, to let me know immediately. There's a $25 deposit. That will secure their spot. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. There is always the chance that things will change. We, we hope that they don't. Um, North Carolina has been one of the more restrictive states, and so um, as cases continue to rise, we, we do anticipate there likely to be a change. We hope not, but just know that if that happens, we'll, we'll let you know immediately. A couple of, of ministry opportunities want to make sure that you are um, mindful of. Uh, White Christmas Food Drive is taking place um, right now. There is a box in the back as you make your way out this morning. Um, drive food um, items are what they're collecting. This will go to help families at Chickamauga City Schools. Uh, we'll be collecting those items through December the 13th. And uh, Jenny Crystal, who is, is helping with that, um, has mentioned that um, her, her hope is to be able to communicate um, even more specifics in terms of what is needed so that you guys maybe can focus on some of those food items. Uh, but would love for you to participate in that. Um, also, really cool to see uh, the shoe boxes up here this morning. This is the, uh, the last Sunday that we are collecting. Jenny said that if you do have a shoe box that you are not able to bring 
today. Um, that the church office uh, will be open tomorrow from 9 to 4, and you can bring your shoebox there, um, and, and that will be the final day of collection. Um, but it's really cool, really cool to see this up here. Uh, I say this every year. Um, what you see is, is not just uh, one person per box that will hear the gospel, but one family um, per box that will hear the gospel as a result of your faithfulness to participate in this. And so um, I haven't done the figuring, but um, there's a lot of people around the world that will hear the gospel because of the faithfulness of, of these families in Chickamauga, Georgia. And so thank you for participating in this. Um, we're going to pray now um, specifically for these families uh, that God would do a work in their lives through this. I, I've shared with this. I, I don't want to belabor the point. Um, several years ago, very first mission trip, uh, we actually met a little girl um, who had received a shoebox over a year prior um, who had a, a letter in English uh, that they were waiting for someone to translate. And so we got to be able to, to meet one of these families who had received a box, and we got to personally share the gospel um, again with one of those families, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so having seen it firsthand, we value this tremendously, and uh, we, we long for other people to have that same opportunity uh, to share the hope of the, of the gospel with these families. All right, so let's pray together. Uh, God, we... Uh, are grateful for Samaritan's Purse, for the, the work that they do um, in many different areas, um, from disaster relief to things like Operation Christmas Child. And, and so as these boxes are, are delivered around the world, um, God, we pray that, that your gospel would go out in power and in might, uh, that the Holy Spirit would take the blinders off, uh, and that these folks who may be hearing the gospel for the very first time um, would understand their sin and their need for a Savior and that they would be transformed all through uh, a, a shoebox full of, of material things uh, that gives a launching point, a platform to share the hope of the gospel. So God, I pray for every box here, every family that is represented um, that will receive one of these boxes and, and then that it goes even beyond those families. Uh, God, that you would save souls that they would repent of their sin and follow you, and that someday, someday, when we are in heaven, worshiping our God for all of eternity, that there will be people around us who we have never met, but who come to faith in Christ because of a ministry like this. And we thank you so much, God, for allowing us to be a part of that. God, we give you glory and praise and honor for you alone, for you alone can save. And as a result of that, we worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Thank you, Michael. The Master hath come and he calls us to follow him. Let's stand together as we sing. Words are on screen. The Master has come. The Master has come and he calls us to follow the track of the footprints he leaves on our way far over the mountain and through the deep hollow the path leads us on to the mansions of day the master has called us the children who fear him who march neath christ's banner his own little band. We love him and seek him. We long to be near him and rest in the light of his beautiful land. The master has called us. The road may be dreary and dangers and sorrows are strewn on the track. But God's Holy Spirit shall comfort the weary. We follow the Savior and will not turn back. The Master has called us, no doubt and temptation may compass our journey. We cheerfully sing, press onward. Must follow the King. The Master has called us in life's early morning with 
spirits as fresh as the dew on the sun. We turn from the world with its and its scorning to cast in our lot with the people of God. The Master has called us his sons and his daughters. We plead for his blessing and trust in his love. And through the green pastures beside the still waters, he'll lead us at last to his kingdom above. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I? Beside, can I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, hear my faith in him to dwell. For I know what ever befall me, all things well. For I know. our song through endless ages Jesus let us all the way be seated please
Oh, the wondrous cross. It is what bids me come and die, but it draws us to this place this morning. It brings us to this moment this morning where we can uh, bask in the glories of the fact that we have been redeemed, that we have been set free by our very good, good, good Savior. This morning, I want to begin with one extra announcement. I know that as we've been doing this technological uh, hoops that we've been jumping through, that sometimes that announcements can go by the wayside. They're not all heard perfectly always, and so I'm going to reiterate something that we announced a couple of weeks ago. First Baptist Church has reached the point that the ministerial staff and the deacons have come to a conclusive agreement that we need to take steps and measures towards moving to have uh, another full-time ministerial staff person. Now, the reason, the main reason behind this is we want to be a proactive church and not a reactive church. God has continued to have his hand of faithfulness on his people in this place, not only financially, but also numerically and spiritually. We've seen uh, continued growth happening in this place in all three of our services. We've seen continued families joining the church and the ministry of the church in order to continue to press forward in the kingdom of God needs to think along the lines of planning for God's kingdom, not our kingdom. And so in order to do that, we're taking some steps now to endeavor to to be wise about how we press forward. So we put together a job description that we're finalizing that the pieces have all come together on. We're going to make that available to you this week. If you would like to see that and review that and you have some questions about it, you can do that. It's going to be by the office. Also, next Sunday, I'll have it in print form at the back of all of our services so you can read over that and take a look at it. The reality is this. Our church... Uh, ministers to well over 400 people. And with that being the case, there are families and nuances. And there's, Michael has shared with you guys that you, for some of you, you have no idea the amount of things that are taking place in the lives of people. Now, some of you do because you're interconnected and interwoven with some of the people that you're sitting next to here and now. But the truth is, because we have three services and it crosses the gap of several hours of time, there are things that are even going on in other folks' lives that you may not have even heard about. And the truth of that is, if we want to be continued to to be a church that ministers to the hearts of people, to be advancing the kingdom of God, we've got to be kingdom-minded folks. And in order to do that, we plan and endeavor very pragmatically towards the future. And so the next step that we're taking is to to look at that. And and if you have questions about that, I'll be glad to to walk through some of those things with you to to show you the reason behind a lot of our, our moving in that direction. This morning... We're going to be continuing our study in 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 3, looking at verses 18 through 22. This morning, I've entitled the sermon, King Stories. Stories of Kings. Uh, Now, look with me for for just a moment, right up here. Everybody, let me see your eyes, so that I know you're all hearing me on this. We're going to do some precise theology today. We're going to have to be a little bit surgical in what we're doing, because in this handful of verses, there are some complicated words, all right? some tricky aspects that we're going to have to view from some different angles. And lest we lose the glory of the sermon in the midst of the exegesis, I want to set our eyes on the story. All right. This morning we're going to be focusing on a centralized story, the story of the gospel. But we're going to be talking about stories. Story, that word itself is powerful. Stories are very powerful. They're captivating. And so I thought, what better way to begin the service this morning than to tell you all a story. When I was 17 years old, I was living up in Dayton, Tennessee, good old Ray County. Now, if you've been up there, you've seen some things pop up along the way. But back when I was 17, you know, four or five years ago, things were, yeah, things were, were not as, as populated up there. The only thing that really was was a, an Ingalls grocery store. There was a Walmart, and I think there may have been a, a Goodies, and, and, a, and there was a McDonald's, and that kind of stuff right around there. So there wasn't much to do. Well, one day... My buddies and I were just running around town goofing off, and we decided we, we wanted some candy and maybe a, a soda. And so we stopped off at the Ingles, and my buddies had gone in ahead of me, and so I'm the last person in line, and I've got my, my Skittles and my soda or whatever it was that I had, and I'm waiting there in line, <clears throat> just by myself at this point. And in front of me, there's a lady that's a fair bit older than I am, and she keeps looking back at me. She just keeps looking back and keeps looking back, and she'll kind of turn towards me and just kind of look for almost staring And I was, I was, I mean, at 17, I'm kind of thinking this is a little bit, you know, an awkward thing. I don't know what this, but I'm going to be polite. And so finally, when she looks back again, I just said to her, ma'am, is there there something I can help you with? I thought maybe she knew me or something. And she said to me, she said, you look just like my son. I said, oh, that's, that's really sweet. She said, he died about 20 years ago, 
tragically in Iraq, and that, you know, it kind of broke my heart, and she was having this conversation with me, and, and so uh, I tried to be just kind and soft to her, so she went back around loading her stuff onto the conveyor belt. Well, she kind of turns to me again softly, and, and then she turns back. I could tell she's nervous, but she wants to ask me something, so she turns to me again, and I, and I said to her, I said, I said, there's something I can help you with. She said, I'm going to, she said, I'm going to ask you a really hard question. She said, will you, will you do me a big favor? Will you just tell me bye, mom, when I leave? And I was like, oh my gosh, talk about a gut-wrenching feeling. And so she finishes her, putting her things on the conveyor belt, and I, you know, I'm running through my mind all this stuff of, of how uncomfortable that, that, that really is. And she turns to me, and she says, she says, bye, son. And she walks. I said, bye, mom. And so I, I put my things up there, and, and she, the, the cashier rings my things up. The cashier says that'll be $187. I said, for Skittles and a soda? She said, well, your mom said you were taking care of everything else. <laughs> so at this point, I'm panicked. I'm 17 years old. I, I, I can't afford to pay for this. And so I'm like, I'm like hold on, hold on. So I, I run outside the Ingalls store. I, you know, I'm busting through the doors. This lady is already at her car. She's like, she's pulled a scanner. So she's driving out of the parking lot. And so I'm chasing her car down as fast as I can. She's coming towards the stop sign. And I have to uh, pull her door handle open. Thankfully, the car door was unlocked. And so I start pulling on her leg like I'm pulling yours. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so let's be let's <laughs> let's be honest by a show of hands. How many of you did I have? All right, that's what I thought. That story gets almost everybody, unless you've heard a version of it before, and and so you, you weren't captivated by it. But look, storytelling is powerful. Storytelling can can draw people in if you just show show a slight hint of emotion. People can be drawn right in, and they're like, "Oh my goodness." She wanted him to say, bye, mom. Oh, like I saw half of you melt right at that moment. It was, it was, I was like, I got him. I was like, I knew it was coming. But look, stories are powerful. And human beings, we're storytellers. Why are we storytellers, though? You know, think about it. If we're, we're not like the animals. We are made in the very image of God. And God himself is the grand storyteller, the archetype storyteller. His stories, though, aren't confined to words on a page. No, they leap off into three-dimensional realities when he speaks. And we are creatures who are embedded in one of these powerful stories. I mean, when I think about the Word of God, it's the authorized version of this true story right from the, word, right, right from the author's mouth. You know, at first glance, it looks like a collection of stories, but it, it turns out after closer inspection that it's one cohesive story from beginning to end. But what kind of story is it? Well, there's lots of ways to, to answering that question. It can be said that the, the Bible is a story of creation, the fall, redemption, and ultimately restoration or recreation. You could say that the Bible is a story of bitter loss giving way to, giving way to glorious victory. But my favorite way of summing up the story of Scripture is this, that it's a, it's a king story. It's a story of a king. Like many of the best stories, the gospel itself, the Bible, is the story of a king, the true story of a king. We are a people who love king stories. Think about it. King Odysseus in Ithaca in the Odyssey. King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. King Aragorn in Minas Tirith. High King Peter. I think about these human stories and God as this great storyteller and we tell stories of kings because we're fascinated and we echo this story of the cosmos, that is the story of all stories that we call the gospel, the good news of God's work in God's kingdom. And so in our passage this morning in 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 22, we're going to see that story, but we're going to look at it from some different perspectives. We're going to see some different angles of that. I'm going to tell you those angles here at the very beginning, but then we'll flesh out each one of them piece by piece. First, we're going to see that Peter looks to this story of the gospel as a story of a king winning his bride. Secondly, Peter will look to the story of the gospel as a king glorying over his enemies. Thirdly, Peter looks to the story of the gospel as a king delivering and judging. And fourthly, he looks to the story of the gospel as a story of a king reigning in triumph. Now, let me see your eyeballs, so I know you're hearing me on this. This passage is rather difficult. There are some confusing elements, and there is definitive disagreement among faithful commentators and theologians and people who have far wiser minds than mine. But my plea to you this morning is not to lose track of the king story, of the gospel in the midst of that. 
That being said, let's read this text together and then let's get to work. So in chapter 3, beginning in verse 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark in which few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from flesh, but the appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after the angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Like I said, this is a story of the gospel, and it begins with the king winning his bride. The king wins his bride. The gospel is a story of a king who rescues his bride from certain death, and he does this through death that he might be with her forever. Verse 18 says it in that beautiful fashion where Christ died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring them to God, that he might bring them to God. So very first, he's going to lay this story out for us. He makes sure that we understand who is the hero of the story. He wants to make sure that we are certain who the hero of the story is. Look, when you approach the Word of God, it's important for you to realize who the hero of the story is. Oftentimes, somebody will, uh, you know, I think good-hearted, well-intentioned pastors and teachers will say that the Bible is a roadmap for your life. When in reality, the Bible is not a roadmap for your life. The Bible is a gospel story of a one hero, and that hero is King Jesus. Think about it. When you, when you look at the story of David and Goliath, our tendency is to make ourselves the hero. That we're like David, getting ready to slay the, the, the sin of Goliath in our life. Well, that's not what that passage is talking about at all. If we're honest, this book is about the high King Jesus who came to rescue and redeem who God had sent on a powerful rescue mission to come retrieve and save this bride who was in sin and rebellion. So the reason why I'm talking about this, and I'm talking about this is because this king, this label is is Christ. Who is Christ? What does the word Christ mean? Well, it comes from the, the Greek word Christos, which we get from the Hebrew word Messiah. It's the anointed savior, the promised king of the Old Testament. The word is derived from that idea of the anointed one. The vernacular of the Old Testament, where it's most direct direct reference to the one who is anointed. When you think back to to 1 Samuel or or Exodus chapter 28, the kings of Israel would be anointed with oil, symbolically to show them being anointed by God for kingship, for rule, to be led by the Spirit of God as they lead the people of God. And using that picture, the prophets of the Old Testament promised to this ultimate anointed king, this Messiah, this Savior who would come and finally save his people. And so he would do this through his own suffering. And in doing so, though, he would establish an unshakable kingdom of God whose increase would know no end. So the hero of the story is this anointed king, this king of kings, this one who's coming to save in fulfillment of all of the ancient hopes that have been promised before, and that is Christ Jesus himself. The hero of the story is Jesus. The, the king who is the hero is, is our king, and it's King Jesus. And that's who we identify first and foremost. But then he goes on further in verse, one to, or in verse 18 to say, Look, why, what, what did this king do to save his bride? The king came to suffer and die for his bride. This king came to suffer and to die. Peter tells us he was put to death in the flesh. He suffers death so that his bride, who was facing death, could taste life. Now, when he speaks of this bride, church, you recognize he's speaking of us. He's speaking of believers. He's speaking of those who would be in Christ. The king story is a gospel story that is a vicarious, substitutionary atoning by a king who goes to the shameful cross of Roman execution in order that he might rescue and redeem his bride. Doesn't this story echo of of our king stories that we, we write fantasy about? of the one who has to sacrifice so greatly for the the one who is undeserving. It says the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous. Categorically, we are the unjust, we are the unrighteous, and the just one came to get us. To understand the the, the gravity of the gospel, we must also understand the depravity of our sin. 
To understand the gravity of the gospel, we must understand the depravity of our sin. To, to show the distance that, that, that was traveled, where the, the just came for the unjust. So Peter tells us what the king did to save his bride. And then Peter tells us why we needed saving in the first place. He suffered, sure, but why did he suffer? Well, he suffered for sins, for her sins. It wasn't just suffering for her in her place to give her life where she was facing death. It was suffering the death that she deserved. There's a distinction there. There's an important distinction that is there. He's not just suffering to give her life. He's also suffering that which she deserved, that she had earned. It was the, the suffering of the righteous king for his unrighteous bride. Look, we're often very comfortable talking about how Jesus came to rescue us from our brokenness and to give us healing. We're very comfortable about, you know, at a distance saying Jesus saves us. We tend to leave it there, though, in the abstract that Jesus died to save me. What Peter is forcing us to do, though, is to draw a straight line from this king who is suffering on the cross to even the gossiping that we were involved in yesterday. To, to, the, to the lust that fills our, our hearts on occasion, to the sin that we have done, the, it draws a straight line to the unforgiving bitterness that we nourish towards people who have wronged us. We don't sin in the abstract, folks. We sin in the concrete. It's not some metaphysical world of, you know, oh, I may have. No, it's what we do. What we, do. we don't sin in general. We sin specific. And he had to die because we are unjust. The righteous had to die because we are un un unrighteous. There was no other way. Either he paid for our sins or we pay for our sins. Either the king will be judged in our place or we will be judged by the king. Again, folks, we, we, we dive through this verse and we unpackage these words that we might understand the gospel. I don't care if you've been saved for seven minutes or for 70 years. Diving deeper into the gospel is good for all of us. And wrapping our minds around this and having it feed our hearts and lives to sanctify us to be more like Christ is significant for each and every one of us. So hear my plea this morning, hear Peter's words of inspiration for us this morning. Then Peter tells us why he saved her. Wake up! This is, this is going to be some good stuff right here. This is great stuff. Why did he save her? Why did the king die? To save his bride, yes, assuredly, but to save her for what? He died to save the world, but to save the world for what? Peter answers that question himself. For Christ died also for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that, here comes the answer, so that he might bring us to God. So that he might deliver us to God. So that he might bring us to God. Because we were made for God. Peter answers this question. He says he died to bring us to himself. Christ suffered that he might bring us to God. This means that you were made for God. Sin in our own lives wants us to fashion some kind of lowercase g-o-d made in our image that is for us, that is for our glory. But the true story behind every story, the story hiding behind every molecule and movement of this universe is that God who makes people in his own image has made them for himself. And this means that you cannot be satisfied with anything apart from God. A, a God of your own shaping, of your own imagination, will never provide satisfaction for you. It's impossible by design and by definition because you were made for God. And Jesus came to get you, to redeem you. That yet, while we were rebellious, he came to get us. And so what Jesus does is he brings us back to God. And in doing so, we, we, we fathom the goodness of the gospel. I hope you can hear me on this this morning. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how long you've been Jesus, known Jesus. This is the goodness of what our king did to bring us to God. This is a big deal. I, I, I want you to be a little more excited than you are. I want, to, I want you to feel the, the depth of what this means, that our good God, this good king, would die and rise again to take us back to God. This is the gospel. This is why we're here. This is why we do what we do. This is why we believe what we believe. This is why we press on. This is why we press forward. It's because of the goodness of what our king did. And our king glories over his enemies. See, the, the gospel is a story of a king who puts his enemies to open shame. He glories over them in triumph. Look at me again at verse 19. In which he also, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. 
during the construction of the ark in which few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Maybe your first reaction is my first reaction, and second reaction, and third reaction, and fourth reaction. Do what? When you read, look, I'm telling you folks, I spent a great deal of time reading this week. I mean, more than usual, a whole bunch of, more than usual. Um, and studying just to, to unpack some of, this, some of this verse, because look, it's a tricky verse. Everyone from Augustine to Aquinas to Calvin to MacArthur reads this, interprets it slightly different. They're not in total disagreement, but there's some different nuances here. And I honestly, I don't have time to unpack all of what it means, but uh, what, I, what I'll do is, is this. I'm going to tell you the, the, where I land. I'm going to state what I think, and I'm going to defend it from a scriptural perspective of what this verse means and what it's going for. But I've spent, I'm telling you, this week I've spent hours just on this particular verse alone so that we can you know, discuss it. In one sentence, it's this. When Jesus' body was put to death, his spirit was made alive, and it heralded his own victory over the demonic spirits imprisoned since the flood. To put it differently, this passage is about Jesus declaring victory over the enemies who thought they had defeated him on the cross. That's the simple version of it. In brief, I'm going to give you a five-fold explanation as to why I think that that's what that verse is saying. But just know that there are greater minds than mine that don't see it exactly the same way. Similar, but different. Now, this is what I think Peter is saying through the inspiration of the Spirit of God. That Jesus said that he would be in paradise on the very day of his crucifixion and not in hell. So that's why I don't think that he descended to hell and is, is preaching there. I don't think that's what this is saying. The word for spirits in this phrase, spirits in prison, is only used once in the New Testament to refer to people. Uh, the rest of the times it's used is it's used to refer to demonic spirits. So there is a, a popular idea that Jesus descended to hell to preach an offer of salvation to lost souls, but I believe that that violates the clear statement in Hebrews chapter 9 that it's appointed once, upon, once for man to die, and then after that comes the judgment. Fourth, the, the language Peter <coughs> uses here uh, it corresponds very nicely with the language that he uses in 2 Peter chapter 2, where he's talking about John, God's judgment of imprisoned angels who were fallen, also in the context of Noah's flood, which we see here. And then finally, that contrary to the popular idea that Peter is referring to Jesus preaching the gospel to the saints of the Old Testament waiting for the work of the cross to, to free them, the word translated as, as preached or proclamed, proclamized or proclaiming here is <coughs> not talking about the gospel, but rather the idea of a proclamation, a victorious proclamation. So if we bring it all together, Peter is saying that even as the demonic forces of darkness transpired to put Jesus on the cross, seemingly they triumphed over him, but Jesus in reality triumphed over them in his resurrection. They managed, yes, to put him to death in the flesh, but through that very act, they made him alive in spirit. And in that spirit, he went and gloated in victory over them, proclaiming his destruction. <clears throat> because the king had triumphed over his enemies. Look, this is one of the great themes of the New Testament. The great victory of Christ on his cross over the kingdom of darkness and her demonic powers. It's the idea that shows up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it says, O oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? This battle cry of truth. That he snatched the victory from the claws and crushed them under his bruised heel because the cross is the ultimate exclamation point that Christ the King has triumphed over his enemies and gloried over them. He continues this idea, this theme, by giving us another angle to this king story where he talks about the flood. And so we just see this king who delivers and this king who judges. The king delivers and judges. The gospel is a story of a king who rescues through flood, cleansing his people as he destroys his enemies. <clears throat> he talks about the flood, then in verse 21 he says, Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt, but from the but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Again, we come upon a, a, a tricky verse. He says, baptism saves you. And if you've been around any you know, good preacher, you'll know for a fact that they say, well, the baptismal waters aren't, aren't magical. The, the water itself isn't special. 
We're not going to go too deep into the weeds here, but we're going to unpack this by looking at the previous verse and seeing what he's talking about when he's talking about Noah's flood. Noah's flood is recounted in the early chapters of, of Genesis, and it's an example of something that shows up repeatedly through the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the theme is this, it's of water judgment, that God delivers his people through the waters, even as he sends those waters to judge their enemies. Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit of God hovers over the waters. Genesis chapter 6, we see man is so corrupt, so evil, that what Moses records there is that every thought and intention of the heart of man was so evil all the time. And so God would send a flood to destroy the world, to cleanse it from evil. But here's the great foreshadowing of the gospel that has come, that, that God, while he sends judgment, is also offering redemption, and he delivers his people through Noah and the ark. And the pattern starts to develop here. God's enemies, judged by water. God's people, delivered by water. And we'll see this pattern show up again. You see in Exodus, Pharaoh trying to be a god. He commands his own judgment, and he says that all the male Israelite babies should be drowned. And so God, unfolding the story, because he's the great storyteller and architect, he turns Pharaoh's plan on its head. And so how does he do this? Well, he has a faithful servant build an ark. See, Moses' mama would put together a basket, and while it's, it's translated as a basket of reeds in Hebrew, it's nothing, nothing more than saying that she built a boat. She built a, a, something to bring him to, to safety. And the irony doesn't end there. No, see, Moses would grow up, and he leads his, Peter, his people to, to freedom from Pharaoh's slavery. And so God again plays out this, this theme of water judgment at the Red Sea. The people of God pass through the waters unharmed. Then the enemies of God come behind and they are crushed. Do you see it? Do you see God's... Hey, I'm asking you. Do you see it? Are you walking with me? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? All right, good. This is the picture that shows up where Peter's wanting to see you to see that your baptism and my baptism is a sign of water judgment. It's a recapitulation, a miniature version of the flood. <coughs> and that's why Peter can unapologetically say, baptism now saves you. But... Listen, folks, we don't stop with one phrase. We look at the whole sentence. So he, he then clarifies, not the removal of dirt from the body. So he's not talking about the physical aspect of getting in that tub up there and being dunked under the water. It's not what he's talking about. He says, but the appeal of faith in the, in the resurrected king, the identification with his death and his burial and his resurrection in the waters of baptism. I love talking about baptism with kids and they grasp this picture that it is a, an outward symbol of an inward condition because what is taking place in the baptism is we are being recognized with Christ. Every pastor says it pretty much the same way. They might use slightly different terminology. But they say, you know, based on your profession of faith, my, my brother or my sister, I now have the privilege of, of baptizing you, buried in Christ, and raised to walk in newness of life. This, this idea is being identified in Christ's death burial and resurrection and putting to death our flesh, rising in the spirit to live for Christ. This is what he's saying. This is what he's referring to. It's not the physical waters of baptism that save you. It's the appeal of faith in the resurrected king. Our baptism is a powerful sign of our salvation. And just as this water in Noah's day was a potent sign of the world's judgment, but it was also Noah's impending salvation. <clears throat> and in this, we can see the king who reigns. The gospel is a story of a coming, the coming of a king into his kingdom, a kingdom that will expand under his rule so that every particle of the opposing kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, will be put into flight, subdued, and put under his feet. Look at verse 22. Who is at the right hand of the Father, having gone to heaven, after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him? The king has saved his bride from death through his death. The king has gloried in his victory of resurrection over his demonic rivals. The king has drowned his enemies in the water of, of judgment, even as he saves his people through those waters. And now the king ascends to his throne that he might rule. Having conquered his enemies, the king rules from his kingdom and his heavenly throne, and everything has been put in subjection underneath his feet. Psalm 47 Sing praise to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne, 
the prince of the people gather as the people of God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Recognize, folk, that the Psalms, they are the Psalter. They are the songbook, the prayer book of the people of God. Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Psalm 146, the Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, all generations. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The, king of the, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against the anoint, his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. The king of the age is immortal, invisible. The only God be all honor and glory forever. First Timothy. I read all of these just to remind us of this king, the one who is the great king. <coughs> the story of the cosmos is a, king, is a king story. It's a story of a king who came to rescue and redeem. I leave you with these concluding words, these thoughts of application for our hearts and lives. The king died, the just for the unjust, to bring you to God. We confess our sin and come to Christ that he might bring us to him. And in this we accept no lesser substitute for the satisfaction of our soul than that which for our soul was formed, God himself. We shout over our demonic enemies. Jesus triumphed over them and putting them to shame. Not with arrogance in ourself, but in great trust for the one who reigns we laugh with our king at the kingdom of darkness. We can charge the very thing that we might fear. See, the king has judged his enemies through the very death and the burial that they believed had crowned them with victory, <coughs> but it in fact did not. So we look to our baptism as a promise that God has cleansed our conscience with his blood and a warning not to abandon that ark that rescues us through these waters of flood. The king who has ascended to his throne where he is ruling and reigning for his glory and for our good. So let us live and pray and rejoice and love accordingly. We pray as if our king, who has already rescued us, is in heaven, and we indeed believe that. He is doing his good, good works. We pray as if we have spiritual weapons to tear down strongholds. We pray as if we have, have swords to slay the dragons that will come against us. We enjoy God's good gifts because he is the king who is smiling upon us, pouring out his grace and mercy upon us continually as he has already rescued us. And we look at suffering as, as you know, this idea of immortal hope that nothing can separate us from the love and the mercy and the sovereign hand of God. Not nakedness or famine, not sword, not peril, not your sin, not sin against you, not persecution, not anything. Dear church, when we grasp the truths of the weightiness of the gospel, of how this good king came to rescue his bride, we dive deeper into our understanding of that gospel and grow more in Christ. So like I, like I said, I don't care if you've been saved for a short time or if you've been saved for as long as you can remember. These words should bring and rain encouragement into your heart and mind and cause an upheaval of not only emotion, but of, of intellectual grasping of what God has done. Because if we are a people who love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, it means that we physically, mentally, emotionally connect to the power of what God has accomplished through the gospel. And in that, we become a celebratory people who want to speak the gospel and say, look what my good king did. C come meet my king. I want you to know him. It's King Jesus. Let's pray. Father, your word is so true, and we are in such, in such need of that. God, we are continually a people in need, in needing to be rescued, and we thank you for the rescue mission that you established through your Son. Father, we thank you for his victory over all, over death, over sin, over the grave. Father, we thank you that we can rest in that truth when we come to you. Father, I'm not so foolish to think that, that there are are not struggling folks in this room who need to once again return to that good fountain of the gospel and say, my king, connect to me once again. And I'm also not so foolish to think that everybody in this room ha has recognized you as king. And so if you've heard these words this morning and, and you for the first time have said, you know what, I need to connect to that king. I'd love to share the gospel with you. You can come and ask me about that. We'll have a conversation. But God, help us in this last moment as we sing this hymn of praise, of worship.
God, help us to tune in to what you have spoken to our hearts this morning. God, that each and every one of us, that we're not merely hearers of the word, but we'll also be doers of the word. That though we might have been saved for a period of time, God, that we'll take these truths and we'll seek to, to make application in our lives. That we might ever look more like this king who came to rescue us, King Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Simple final plea. Just live like you know who the king is. And others will, others will see it and they'll ask you. And then they'll see. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's sing together as we go. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. you have a wonderful day.